Good morning, Bridge family. It is great, again, that we can gather as a family, not only our family members who are in this place, again, in Spring Hill, but also those of us uh, who are part of this family in our Columbia campus, and also those joining us online. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, my name is Rob, and I'm one of the staffers here uh, at the Bridge Church. Um, And before I get started into the text, uh, I have just a very important thing that I want to share with you, uh, which that is pastor speak for. I have another announcement for you. Uh, So um, God is not only uh, concerned uh, about the breadth of the ministry of the bridge, in other words, the length of the ministry of the bridge. In other words, we we really do hope and pray that God uh, would use this body of Christ, not only in Middle Tennessee, but really throughout uh, the whole world for his glory and for his supremacy. Uh, But he's also concerned about our depth. So it's not just breadth and length, it's also about our depth. And so the wheelhouse of the depth of any ministry is going to be its emphasis on the scriptures, but also being part of biblical uh, community. Now, one of my uh, favorite phrases within uh, the body of Christ is when I hear brothers and sisters say this phrase, I never thought I would dot, dot, dot. So in other words, I never thought I would uh, serve in the children's ministry because I don't like kids. I, I never thought uh, that I would be greeting people uh, because I, I don't like people. I never thought, uh, you're, you're laughing today. I never, thought, uh, I never thought I would do this or I never thought I would host uh, in our home. And so uh, my prayer is that Uh, you would prayerfully consider completing that thought of, I never thought I would uh, lead a group uh, in my my home and hosting. Uh, And so what we would like to do is to invite you uh, to an interest meeting. Now, let me go ahead and put that uh, information up here for you. Okay, I'm I'm pressing the screen for the first time. (laughs) Um, and so, um, so there's going to be a group interest meeting, uh, and let me tell you what this is. Uh, so this happens today at 11, so obviously you're here, so don't, please don't get up and leave now. Uh, and then today at 4 at this, uh, at this campus, and then also 11 o'clock in our Columbia uh, campus, and this happens also next week. And let me tell you what this is. Uh, we want to encourage you to go to this meeting just to learn of what it means to be a leader in one of our bridge groups. This is not signing you up for it. This is not committing you to it. It's simply to get education and get information on groups. And all we're asking you to do is text group leader, uh, that phrase, to the number 31996. That's all we're asking. And so uh, group leader to the number 31996. Uh, And so does it commit you to anything? It's just simply uh, you are going to get information back on those meetings. Uh, And so we would just just want to encourage you to really really consider that, okay? All right, so now uh, we are concluding our series on the book of James. So uh, we've tried in our context to do a deep dive just in one uh, book of the Bible as we've walked through this epistle uh, from the half-brother of Jesus to not only those Christ followers that he was writing to who come out of Judaism thousands of years ago, uh, but also we believe that the Holy Spirit, who is the ultimate author of Scripture, is omniscient. And so that means there's not only application for those people that he was writing to, but also for us uh, centuries later, also as followers of Jesus. Uh, And so uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to go ahead and put kind of the big idea uh, up on the screen. uh, And then this is kind of, this is the big idea for uh, today. Instead of avoiding suffering, Christ followers can flourish through suffering. Instead of avoiding suffering, Christ followers can flourish through suffering. Suffering. If you remember, if you were part of the first week when we began this series, right out of the gates, James says, Oh, okay, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you go through trials of various kinds. And so then he comes back to this thought uh, in this passage that we're, we're unpacking today. Uh, the reason why I think this principle is really important is that there are times uh, it's easy to complain about the church, isn't it? 
Whenever you have a group of human beings, it's like the easiest thing in the world because we are by nature woefully imperfect. Uh, we, are, we woefully fall uh, short of the standard that God has for us. But one of the sicknesses that people say of the American church or the Western church is what people call the wussification of the church in the West. And, and what that means is any church throughout any part of the world has its strengths and has its weaknesses. So, look, so please understand, I'm not just teeing off on, on church life because I'm, I'm part of the church. And, and so let me tell you what that means in our context is that there can be a sickness that can encroach on the Western church that it's one thing to come here and, and sing and, and learn new things and, and do certain things that are religiously noble, but maybe one of the sicknesses that we have in the West is that when things get hard or when things kind of disintegrate in our personal lives, then we're gone, then we're out. But then when things start leveling out and we're feeling good and we're getting back into the Bible again, all of a sudden we see each other again. And that's kind of the wussification of the American church. But if you're like me, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be part of what the scripture says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the bride of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to show you another statement. And this statement actually is a very ancient statement. The words that are getting ready to go up on the screen in a few moments actually date all the way back to the first century. In other words, if you and I want to see like a real quick portrait of what the church was like within the first century, and remember, uh, this was at a time where the church of Jesus was getting pulverized for her allegiance to Jesus. And what this document is, it's called the letter to Diognetus. We really don't know who Diognetus is. We just know that this has been dated very, very ancient in terms of its age. And so Let's kind of walk through this picture of this church in the first century. So here's, here's what it said. They live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They participate in everything as citizens and endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign country is their fatherland and every fatherland is foreign. They marry like everyone else and have children, but they do not expose their offspring. In other words, they don't destroy children. They are in the flesh, but do not live according to the flesh. They live on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws. Indeed, in their private lives, they transcend the laws. They love everyone, and by everyone, they are persecuted." They are unknown, yet they are condemned. They are put to death, yet they are brought to life. They are poor, yet they make many rich. They are in need of everything, yet they abound in everything. They are dishonored, yet they are glorified in their dishonor. They are slandered, yet they are vindicated. They are cursed, yet they bless. They are insulted, yet they offer respect. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. When they are punished, they rejoice as though brought to life. Those words invigorate me and they remind me to the DNA that God has placed within the bride of Christ that when it gets hotter, uh, when it gets hard, when there's disintegration that occurs, when there's brokenness occurs, it's almost like that pops out the jewel of the bride of Jesus. And so uh, how does that happen though? Because if you're like me, we don't sign up for it. We don't plan for darkness. We don't plan for brokenness. We don't plan for our marriages to disintegrate. We don't plan for our careers to go in directions we thought they would never go. We don't plan for all the fights that we have um, and relational strife that we have with other people. It just kind of tends to dog us as human beings. So how do we do it? James 5, 7 through 12, we're going to go through lots of verses today. And so to give an overview of this passage. And so these last set of verses in James 5, 7 through 20, this is what the word of God says. Be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. 
You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard, I'm rereading, I'm rereading the slide. You know what that means? That means I'm very embarrassed. And then how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear. <laughs> you better believe it. Either by heaven or by earth or by any under oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let me pray. Lord, Thank you so much for your mercy. And Lord, I'm reminded so keenly that it's really only you that can transform lives. And so I pray that you would help me in this moment. And Lord, help me to love you more. In your awesome and precious name, amen. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to walk through this huge set of passages, and we're going to talk about three commitments, three commitments to make when we are walking through it, uh, because uh, the reality is, remember, there's three sets of people uh, in this room in regards to hardship. There are those of you uh, that have just gotten through a trial. You've just gotten through a time that's been very hard or very difficult for you. It's kind of in the rearview mirror right now. Maybe some of you in this room you would like, I am right in the middle. And you would say, I am in the midst of emotions that are hard, circumstances that are hard, relationships that are hard, whatever it may be. And then the rest of us, we just got our seatbelts on because we know that at some point we're going to be entering into some type of trial or hardship coming up in the future. So we need to be disciplined about when that happens. What are commitments that we need to make as followers of Jesus in the midst of it? So here's the first one. First of all, we need to have a commitment to a grander vision. Uh, the reason why this is important is because um, when we are walking through uh, and living through a very, very hard time, our lives become very, very small. We really, um, when I am walking through, if it's some type of uh, bad communication issue with Angela and I, when uh, my teenagers are walking through teenager stuff and it's just really hard and, and when I'm walking through all of that and even, <laughs> this is really bad, even when I get a cold. I wish I could tell you that I'm only thinking about God's glory. I'm only thinking about other people. Oh no, I'm only thinking about me. I'm only thinking about my little world and my little thoughts and my little future. And that's what hardship does. It makes us live a very, very small existence. But we don't have to do that. We don't have, we have an opportunity to do this, a commitment to a grander vision. So what does that actually look like? Well, first of all, we gotta remember, precious fruit takes precious time. 
precious fruit takes precious time. Now, I, I'm, from, I'm originally from southeast uh, Indiana. Uh, I grew up in a town, if, if you've ever heard of the old movie called Hoosiers about uh, high school basketball, that was filmed very, very close uh, to where I am from. Uh, and so therefore, our whole town is surrounded by nothing but fields. A lot of my friends uh, did farming and raised crops and so forth. And one thing that I learned growing up in that environment is that, first of all, that kind of living can be very, very difficult because their whole livelihood actually depends on weather. In other words, they can plan to sow at a certain time. They can plan to um, kind of break, uh, break down uh, the ground as they sow seed, but there's nothing that you can plan when it comes to weather. And that's the illustration that James is using here when he talks about the early and the late rains. Because at this point, at this area of the world, the early rains would be around the fall. And then the late rains would be in like early spring. And the reason why both of those are very important is because you need the early rains when you sow that seed. And you need the later rains for when that crop starts coming up. And the, and the, the crop needs that rain so it can grow and mature. And the reason why farming can be very, very difficult is because, again, their whole livelihood depends on their crop. So therefore, it's a very precious, precious crop. The more precious the crop, the more precious the waiting that needs to be there. Precious fruit takes precious time. Now, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't know this until recently, but like a bamboo tree, uh, I just found out that a bamboo tree is in the ground for four years before it peeks through the surface. In the fifth year, when it grows, it grows 90 feet in two months. Our flesh is not engineered like that because we want everything so quick. But the more precious our goal, the more willing that we are to wait. Precious fruit takes precious time. Not only that, but we got to remember this principle. Uh, We are accountable for our responses. In the midst of our waiting, we're accountable for our responses. Here's a principle. Um, Doing nothing and waiting on the Lord are not the same thing. For many of us, if we're waiting on something to happen, we're wanting a certain conclusion to a certain story. Uh, we're wanting uh, kind of the end goal of something maybe that we're, we're hoping for, or we want something to be over that has been so uncomfortable. What we could do is we could start compromising our faith. So this is what James says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be your yes and your no be your no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. In other words, James is exhorting us as followers of Christ to be people of integrity when it gets hard. Uh, How many times have we made a promise to the Lord, but we start walking through something that's very difficult or tempting, and we compromise our faith, and we start making choices that are unwise, damaging to ourselves, or damaging to other people? A commitment to a grander vision is going to be have precious fruit. Remember, it takes precious time. We are accountable for our responses. But then also remember, suffering anchors us in God's character. Suffering anchors us in God's character. That's all part of a commitment to a grander vision. Um, If I can use a really weird metaphor here, I want us to look at hardship and suffering as like spiritual cement that God pours onto our Christian life to rivet us on the character of God. Um, If you're like me, when it's comfortable and when it's good, 
I have a professed theology that I believe about God, but when the chips are down, when it's hard, or when it seems hopeless, then you find out our real theology. We find out our real belief systems. When everything circumstantially seems to be going against us, when even things that are going, that are, seem like it's going crazy inside of us. And so therefore, a grander vision is going to be committed to the thought that precious fruit takes precious time, uh, that we're going to be accountable for our responses, and suffering anchors us in God's character. Now, I, I have never learn this more in a deep way than something that happened years ago uh, where I live in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we were on a date and we got a call that one of the couples in our church was having their first child. And this was at a time when our church was fairly small. Everybody knew each other fairly well. And so we were able to celebrate with each other fairly easily. And so we cut the date off short. And because the hospital, uh, Southview Hospital, just south of Dayton, was only a half a mile from where we were eating. So we go in there. And it was like everything that you envision on, uh, on a TV show or a movie for this moment. We go into the hospital. We go into the foyer. We go to the right. And down the long hallway, they were last... Uh, hospital room on the right, and there was worship music that was waffling through the hallway, and their community group was sitting at the end of the hallway, and I sit, my wife and I sit down uh, with, with everybody, and not long after that, the husband, his name's Jason, he popped his head out, and he looks at me, and his face was that new dad face, covered in tears had this smile that was huge, and he looks at me, and he says, Rob, do you want to come in and see our baby? The process of pregnancy and waiting, and here's the precious fruit. And I went in there and prayed over that precious baby. Here's what I didn't tell you. Three days before, they found out the baby tragically died in her womb. And they delivered their precious baby stillborn. Everything that I've shared with you about that story is true. Worship music, waffling through the hallway. When I went into the room, I'll never forget there was a song that was playing through their sound system. And it was a song that David Crowder had sung on his very first album. It was like an independent album. I go in. She's holding the body of her precious baby. And the lyrics of this song said this over and over again. To the Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for healing me. And lastly, again, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. What makes a couple know that their baby is already perished? Get a sound system of worship music. Go to a hospital. Peek out of the room with huge smiles and say, do you want to see my child? What is that? It's called a hurting brother, sister in Christ who are really suffering but have a grander vision. Precious fruit takes precious time. We are accountable for our responses and suffering anchors us in God's character. You have heard the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Here's the next thing. We got to remember a commitment to godly community. A commitment to godly community. Um, just going to be uh, transparent with you about my own journey. Uh, so uh, I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but when I am, quote unquote, not doing well, when I'm off on a certain day, uh, when, again, chips seem to be going down, uh, and I'm walking through a season where it seems really, really dark, either circumstantially or inwardly, 
I have this knee-jerk reaction. I isolate with the best of them. Can anybody relate to that? When I'm hurting, I don't want to text people. I don't want to receive texts from people. I don't want to email people. I don't want people to email me. I want to be by myself. And I'll even religiously rationalize it. And I'll go, hey, I have Jesus. I'm good. That is a statement of arrogance. We need godly community, a commitment to godly community. Because first of all, the godly community is where we do real life together. This is what it says. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. I don't know if you've ever been with the body of Christ in your home or maybe you're doing an excursion together. And I really believe that the laughter of Christians, there is something so deep and so beautiful and so powerful about the sincere laughter of followers of Jesus. It is also just as beautiful when everybody's weeping. And if you're like me, it's very easy. We always have this phrase kind of in the modern church that we, do, we join community groups because we do life together. What we're really meaning is I want to hang out, do some Bible study until it's uncomfortable or until it gets personal. That's why where we do real life together. In other words, community win that person who is always giving feedback about scripture all of a sudden says to his or her, her spouse, I'm out of the marriage. Or when that bipolar happens to kick in that week. Or when suddenly somebody finds out that uh, they've got a, something going on medically that may actually take their very life. That is honestly when the community of Jesus is at her most beautiful, is when they suffer together. And so where we do real life together, but also where we restore each other. In fact, if you look at these, these verses from 13 through 18, time and time again, you see this theme of prayer that is echoed through all of this passage. The primary ways that you and I restore each other is not only the truth of God's word, but also by having an ecosystem of prayer. I'm the world's worst at thinking doing something Christian means you do a lot of check off boxes like, okay, we've got together. Okay, we've eaten together. Check. All right, we, oh, you're going to pray. Okay, we got prayer. And then we got our content. We got a curriculum. Okay, we got through it. Okay, check. Um, and then, okay, everybody, bye bye. Get out of my house. And so, and so therefore, we kind of look at community life as kind of this. But folks, that's not how God created us. We're called to restore each other. In fact, it says, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Honestly, this is one of the most disputed passages in all of the New Testament. There are people within the charismatic movement that says if somebody is not healed of sickness, either the person praying is full of sin or the person who is sick is full of sin and their faith is a problem. Uh, I want to remind us that the quality of our faith is not the key. It's the object of our faith. That's the key. I don't know about you. My faith is always pretty weak. Your faith is always pretty weak. Our Lord Jesus is never weak. And so therefore, we got to remember what are we talking about here? There are some who say, yes, absolutely. This is what happens. You anoint oil and that person will uh, rise up. But then there's also theologians who talk about the oil that's more medicinal, that we're coming alongside them and offering them very, very practical care. I want you to know under the sovereignty of God, there is room for both. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, we have to allow that God can suspend the natural laws of this planet at any time and at any place, and he could do something that utterly blows our mind. But we don't make a gospel of it. I want you to know I used to be an elder, and there are times that we prayed and anointed oil for people who were sick, and I can say that there were times that we really did see people become well. Not the majority of the time. 
but we still prayed. We still prayed. One thing we could be unified about, church, is that God has ordained prayer to do something, and we are called to pray. Time and time again, we are called to pray. So a commitment to godly community where we do real life together, where we restore uh, each other. Uh, when I was a young kid, I remember riding in the back seat of my car and dad was driving, mom was in the passenger seat and we're getting ready to go into our small little town and there was another roadway that kind of went off to the right and a person went the wrong way. And as a little child, you can never forget, if you've ever been in a car accident, you never forget the sound of metal crinkling. And I remember this horrible sound of metal being bent and crinkling and, and screaming. And this car went up on an embankment and the lady was immediately bleeding in the passenger seat. What amazed me was all the people that came out of their cars. I remember a guy getting out of the car and taking off his t-shirt and literally getting into that car and getting that t-shirt to soak up the blood and to keep that on her face to try to control the bleeding. My dad uh, got out of the car and was controlling the traffic that was coming in and around. There were other people who were getting to the back seat of the car to dislodge people out of the car. And all these people converged on this wreck. I would argue wouldn't it not be compelling to the unbelieving world when they see the body of Christ, whenever there's some type of car wreck within the body of Christ, they don't see brothers and sisters running away. They see them running too. And using whatever abilities and whatever gifts and whatever we have to offer so that people can be restored, a commitment to godly community. And then lastly, a commitment to a gospel legacy. Um, in other words, when we're walking through the fire, followers of Jesus, we are also still on mission. Uh, if you're like me, I like to go, I need to sit on the bench for a little bit, time out. But the folks, the whole time, we're still on mission. There are still people who are lost. It's one thing to go through hardship as a follower of Jesus, but also we have the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's another thing for people who go through those things and they don't have the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would argue one of the most potent, one of the most powerful, one of the most beautiful witnesses of the good news of Jesus is when we live and share the good news of Jesus and we are hurting at the exact same time. This is what it says in verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. In other words, did you know that when there are people who wander from the truth of God, there is a wandering from the truth before there's a wandering from behavior. And so therefore, when you and I experience people who are not believing the right thing about the character of God, that's already a danger zone. Already we should start feeling mercy, not in a self-righteous way, but because of the mercy that God gave us. And we want to come to them and woo them back to the gospel, to the glorious, beautiful, good news of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, that covers a multitude of sins in the future, a commitment to gospel legacy. Um, I, uh, one of the, the books that really influenced me, probably more than any other type of book outside of scripture, is Christian Biography. You've heard me say that before. And there was a guy in the early 1800s, you gotta love his name, his name, Adoniram Judson. And so he was a missionary to Burma, uh, modern day Myanmar. He went there in 1812, and he died there 38 years later in 1850. Uh, here's a little bit about Adoniram Johnson. While he was there, he was in prison, tortured, kept in shackles, and while he was there, his precious wife, Anne, died. 
He was so despondent over Anne passing away that for months, every day, he went to her gravesite and just sat there. And talking about that, when Anne died, this is what he said. God is to me the great unknown. I believe in him, but I cannot find him. Well, eventually Adoniram translated the New Testament in the Burmese language. And then by 1834, he finished the Old Testament. So here he is. He translates the scriptures in their Burmese language. At this point in the 1800s, the number of Christ followers in this nation was anywhere from 12 to 25 in the whole nation. A few years back, Paul Borthwick, an American missiologist, went over to Myanmar, formerly Burma, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the translation of the Bible into the Burmese language. Paul gets up to speak, and there's a Bible that's on the podium, and it has an engraving on it. And it said, translated by Reverend A. Judson. His translator was a man by the name of Matthew. This is what Paul said to Matthew. Matthew, what do you know of this man? Matthew began to cry as he said, we know him. We know how he loved the Burmese people, how he suffered for the gospel because of us, out of love for us. He died a pauper, but left the Bible for us. When he died, there were few believers. But today, there are over 600,000 of us. And every single one of us traces our spiritual heritage to one man, the Reverend Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson never saw this. He died without seeing any of this. Are you and I okay to be used by God in such a way that we may not even see the fruit of how God uses us in our lifetime? A commitment to a gospel legacy. Before I finish, my favorite phrase probably in this whole passage in James 5, 7 through 20, is the phrase, precious fruit. The more precious the fruit, the more willing we wait on the Lord. And so in the last gathering, I was thinking about that during, while we were singing, and, and then I thought of this passage that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth many years ago. This is what he said. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Guess what, Bridge? If we're in Christ, we have that precious fruit. We have that precious fruit in Christ. Not only that, someday we're going to see him. Do you know this Christ? Do you know this Jesus? Are you willing today to say, I want to turn from ruling and trying to lead my own life, from me trying to be my own functional savior, and I want to put all my trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ? I believe he lived for me. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again from the grave for me. And I want him to lead my life. Today is the day that you could be saved. And if there's anything that you need to hear that needs to be very, very clear, the hero of this sermon is Jesus Christ. The hero of this pastor guy is Jesus Christ. The hero of the Bridge Church is Jesus Christ. He is the hero P.
period. Let me pray. Lord, thank you again for your goodness to us and you. Lord, we ask for your enabling work that's powered by your Holy Spirit, that's informed by your word. Help us to grow deeper in you so that when storms come, when it gets hard, when it gets uncertain, that Lord, we will wait on you because we believe the fruit of who you are is precious. Help us not to isolate ourselves. And Lord, help us to be committed to a gospel legacy where many will bow their knee to you. Lord, we love you in your awesome and precious name. Amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for watching the Bridge Church YouTube channel. We're so glad you joined us. We hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right for your screen. Um, here at the Bridge, we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. And so we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel, to share on social media, and you can tag us at at Bridge Church TN. That's at Bridge Church TN. And if you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so by clicking the link in the description of the video. Hey, once again, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to find out more information about the Bridge Church, you can go to bridge.tv. That's bridge.tv. And we hope to see you here soon.